How far will the U.S. go in attacking Iran-linked targets in the Middle East? Washington has carried out strikes against pro-Iran armed groups in Syria and Iraq. They're a retaliation for drone attacks last week in Jordan. So could this spill over into a wider conflict? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. The United States says that it struck at least 85 targets in Iraq and Syria using long-range bombers flown directly from the US. They were carried out in response to a drone attack on an army base in Jordan last weekend that killed three American soldiers. Armed groups backed by Iran are targeting the US over its support for Israel's war on Gaza. President Joe Biden says the US attacks are just the beginning of its retaliation. So, how will Iran react? And could this lead to a wider regional conflict? There's plenty to dissect and to discuss. But first, this report takes a closer look at those U.S. strikes. The U.S. has launched dozens of airstrikes in Syria and Iraq using long-range bombers. The White House says it does not seek conflict in the Middle East but warns that attacks will continue at times and places of its choosing. U.S. military forces struck more than 85 targets at seven facilities utilized by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and the militant groups that they sponsor. Three of the facilities are in Iraq, four of them are in Syria. American officials call the strikes a retaliation to a drone attack on U.S. troops nearly a week ago. Three soldiers were killed and dozens injured at a military base in Jordan. Presumably the um, goal of the campaign is to reestablish deterrence, which is at the end of the day a political and a psychological condition. So uh, the question is, can the, these actions inflict enough damage on Iranian interests that uh, the Iranians will, uh, you know, basically step back from doing this sort of thing again in the future. Iraq's military condemned the attack as a violation of its sovereignty. And Syria's government says the occupation of its territory by U.S. forces cannot continue. But President Joe Biden vows that these strikes are just the beginning, leaving many to wonder how far the U.S. is prepared to go. Vincent Monaghan, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests for today's discussion from Tehran. We're joined by Mohamed Marandi, a political analyst and professor at the University of Tehran. From London, Renat Mansour, senior research fellow and director of the Iraq Initiative at Chatham House, a British think tank. And from Washington, D.C., Lawrence Korb, senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Uh, Mohamed Marandi, uh, professor, uh, how dangerous a moment is for uh, is this for the region? Will these strikes be the last? The United States is only digging it, digging itself into in a into a deep, deeper hole. Uh, the United States uh, is illegally occupying one third of Syria. The United States keeps its military bases in Iraq, despite the fact that the Iraqi Parliament has told them to leave. They struck bases that are uh, linked to the. Iraqi military, they belong to the mili Iraqi military. The Iraqis condemned the attack, and the same is true with Syria. Uh, they, Biden wants to look strong. He hasn't attacked the Iranians. And most importantly is the fact that this is about Iraqi and Syrian sovereignty. The Americans like to call everyone Iranian proxies, the Yemenis, the, the Lebanese, the uh, Palestinians and the Iraqis and the Syrians, but that's just, they're just misleading public opinion and they're fooling themselves. People don't like their countries to be occupied. Okay, you, you could also um, uh, argue, uh, Professor, that, that Iran is occupying uh, parts of, of Syria, Iraq and, and, and Lebanon, couldn't you? No, Iran doesn't have any forces in Iraq and Iran's uh, role in Syria is with the consent 
of the internationally recognized government in Damascus. And uh, in any case... But it has, but it has, it United has, it has proxy, it does have proxy militias though, doesn't it? No, whatever Iran does in Syria, it is with the consent and support of the government. Iran helps defeat ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Remember, in, on February the 12th, 2012, Jake Sullivan, the now UN, uh, U.S. National Security Advisor, sent an email to Hillary Clinton saying, who was the Secretary of State, saying that in Syria, Al-Qaeda is on our side. ISIS came from Al-Qaeda. The U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012 said that the U.S. allies in the region wanted to establish a Salafist, a Salafist entity between Iraq and Syria. And then the Gen General Michael Flynn, who was the head of the, that agency at the time, said in an interview on, on Al Jazeera that the U.S. took a willful decision to support the establishment of that Salafist entity. That was ISIS. So the Iranians, when the U.S. and its allies were establishing ISIS and Al-Qaeda and their affiliates, the Iranians were helping the Syrians and the Iraqis to prevent ISIS from taking over Damascus and Baghdad. Renard Mansour in London, what do you make of what you just heard? Well, I think, uh, I mean, it's important to kind of nuance some of this history. Uh, the Americans uh, were also invited um, to Iraq in 2014 by the Iraqi government uh, to support in the fight against ISIS. So at that time and during the fight against ISIS, the Americans and the Iranians had the, had a common enemy. And they fought, uh, you know, not let's say not on the same side by side, but with this, with the common end. After ISIS, we're living in this sort of post-ISIS uh, arena, the, the, this region where now they're sort of turned on each other, and this is the, the latest of this escalation. So both Iran and the U.S. have significant influence across these countries. Um, the U.S. does have troops in. Uh, Iraq and Syria. And Iran, of course, has, you know, I agree that calling them proxies takes the agency away from these groups, but they are aligned and, and, and they do work together. And, and, and these are networks that span across Yemen, Lebanon, Syria and Iraq, um, pursuing at times Iran's uh, foreign policy goals. So this is a very dangerous, I think, uh, you know, some are calling it tinderbox right now, where neither the Iranians nor the Americans want an all out war or a direct conflict, but what we're seeing is this tit-for-tat show of force that's making the region very dangerous. Yeah, Iraq's military spokesperson, or at least the military spokesman for the prime minister, said that the, this U.S. reprisal will have disastrous consequences for the region. What, what do you mean when you say dangerous, and what do you think he meant by disastrous? Well, again, the, the, there's a certain theater being constructed right now. The Iraqi government is trying to present itself as a sovereign country. But of course, sovereignty, you know, it, it, it's very difficult to, to, to maintain when you have the Iranians, the, the Turks, the Americans, all constantly violating the, the boundaries of Iraq. So from the Iraqi government's perspective, for its own population, it's trying to say, we are sovereign and we, you know, we need to stand up when our territories are being attacked, when groups linked to the government, and keep in mind that groups like Kitab Hezbollah, uh, uh, Harakat al Nujaba, and these different popular mobilization armed groups um, are connected to the Iraqi government. Um, and, and so it's, it's the prime minister and his spokesperson coming out and presenting the veneer of a sovereign state when the reality is far from. Lawrence Korb, do you want to come back on, on anything that you've heard so far before I put a direct question to you? Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind that we left Iraq in 2011. In fact, I talked to Maliki about uh, staying. Basically, we came back in 2014 at their invitation because of what ISIS was doing. And basically, that has been our role. <clears throat> uh, before October 7th, we were carrying this out. We were talking to the Iraqis about leaving. Sometimes they say something publicly, but privately, no, they still wanted us to say. But after October 7th, you had over 160 attacks on the American forces there in Iraq and Syria. 
Fortunately, no one was killed, so our response was not overwhelming or as uh, strong as it has been when the Americans died. And that's where we are right right now. And my experience with the Iraqis, a lot of times they'll say something publicly to appease the Iranians, but then privately they'll say, no, no, we really still want you to stay. What does it mean for the U.S.'s desire to withdraw uh, from Iraq completely? I mean, will it, as Iran's foreign ministry has said, lead to the U.S. actually becoming more, not less involved in the region? Well, again, a lot depends upon how long we need to uh, go after the groups that were responsible, not only for killing the Americans, but those 160 attacks, and whether Iran will try and rein these groups in. You know, Iran has three proxies in the region. They've got the Houthis in Yemen. They've got uh, they've got Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon, and then they've got the uh, these uh, Iraqi uh, groups uh, in uh, in in Iraq. They completely control Hezbollah. The others, they don't have much control, but they have some. And I think this is what we're going to expect, not only in Iraq, but with the uh, Houthis. Mohammed Morandi, U.S. National Security Spokesman John Kirby said that the, the goal is to get the attacks on U.S. interests to stop. We're not, he said, quote, looking for a war with Iran. Now, no targets were hit within Iran in these retaliatory strikes. How will Iran and its proxies respond? Will it, will it uh, rein these groups in as uh, Lawrence said the U.S. wants it to? Well, let's be clear, contrary to what your guest in the United States says, these are not proxies. And the real issue here is the genocide in Gaza, have no doubt about it. And the United States, as we speak, is preparing the Israeli regime for an, an expansion in Lebanon. So in the coming weeks, we may have heavy fighting uh, in southern Lebanon. Uh, the United States is not retaliating in Syria. The United States is an illegal occupation force in Syria. In the Al-Tanf area where it occupies, in fact, there are tribes that were loyal to ISIS. Those tribes are trained by the Americans right now. And they use that area, Al-Tanf, to attack Syrian government forces. And in the, in the last couple of months, they carried out two major attacks in each case, killing between 15 to 20 uh, conscript soldiers on buses, and I think on both occasions. So the United States, its presence in Syria is illegal. It is stealing Syrian oil in the east of the country and exporting it. In Iraq, the United States has bombed Iraqi military positions. It has destroyed Iraqi facilities that were constructed and paid for by the Iraqi government. This is the reality on the ground. Nothing will change that. And I should also add that the United States, after the assassination of the Iraqi commander Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, alongside General Qasem Soleimani, at the Iraqi International Airport for over four years ago, the Iraqi parliament demanded that the United States leave, and they never did. They said they'd leave, but the United States has one strong card to play with, and that is that all of Iraqi oil that is sold, the money goes to accounts in the United States. And whenever the Iraqi government goes too far, the Americans start withholding Iraqi funds and creating a crisis in Iraq. So the Americans are like the godfather. They stand back, they pretend they're the good guys, but just like in Gaza, where they are part of the, this genocide, uh, and here they play the same role. Remember, the United States and Iraq, they helped Saddam Hussein. The West gave Saddam Hussein chemical weapons. The U.S. fought alongside Saddam Hussein against Iran in 1988, striking Iranian ships. And then it turned against Iraq. Later on, it invaded Iraq. Who created this mess? It was the United States. Lawrence, do you want to come back on, on that? Well, again, I think it's important to keep in mind that we did leave when the Iraqis asked us to leave. OK, we were willing to leave some troops there, but Maliki said no. So we left completely. 
We were asked to come back by the Iraqi government. And the other thing I think is important to keep in mind, the Iraqi government publicly will say things to appease Iran, but privately they'll tell us, no, we really still want you to, uh, uh, to stay. So I think it's important to, to, to keep that in mind. And basically we ended up in Syria to fight ISIS, which was going after the Iraqi Kurds. That's why we were, were up there. So this has been our role. And prior to the, attack, the uh, October 7th attacks, there was no conflict going on. There was no shelling or anything like that. It was October 7th when Iran, I think, gave the green light to a lot of what they call the Quds Force uh, people in Iraq to attack Americans in Iraq and, and uh, but, Syria. So I think but, but, that that but, is the key but, thing. But, but Lawrence, I mean, how, how do you answer uh, uh, Professor Miranda's accusations that, 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 that the U.S. has ultimately caused all, all of this? Um, you know, he, for instance, he was, he was saying that, that the U.S. is in Syria illegally and is stealing its oil. No, wait a second. We're not there illegally. We went there when the Iraqi government asked us to protect the Iraqi Kurds and ISIS went up into Syria. That's where we're there. We're not there. In fact, we've been criticized for not getting involved in the Syrian civil war, which was part of the Arab Spring. Reynard, I know you're waiting patiently, but I'll just throw, the, throw it briefly back to, to Mohammed Morandi just to, just to answer that, and then we'll move on. Look, I gave the evidence People can go back to the email, Jake Sullivan. They can go to the Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012. They can go to Michael Flynn's interview on Al Jazeera. They can also go and look at the history of the U.S. stealing oil. They can also go back into 2014 and 2015 when Iraqi oil was being sold at, by ISIS to neighboring countries and to Arabil as well. And the U.S. Air Force back then was flying over ISIS positions, and they never struck any of those thousands of tankers. It was only when the Russians actually entered, one of the first things that they did was they, they struck those convoys. The history of the United States and ISIS is clear as day. And the United States, its history with Saddam Hussein being an ally of Saddam Hussein and the West giving him chemical weapons, that is clear as day as well. Okay. Right. But the United States always wants to present itself as the protagonist, just like in Gaza. Okay. In Gaza, it's the Palestinians' okay. fault. History began on October the 7th. End of story. That's not going to solve the problem for the United States. The United States is a declining power, and it has to begin to look at reality okay. objectively. Otherwise, right. it will suffer more than anyone else. All right, Reynard, th thanks for, for waiting so patiently. Before, I, again, I ask you a, a, a specific question, do you, do you just want to uh, uh, come in on, on, on what you've heard here? Yeah, sure. I think that, you know, trying to build a narrative between good guys and bad guys, no matter who is on the good and bad, isn't really helpful to trying to understand what is going on. Of course, both the Iranians and the Americans pursue their interests. They pursue politically, economically, militarily, how they could maintain as much influence as possible in the in, in the in the region. Mm. Now, what's become clear is that the Americans have had more of an incoherence to their foreign policy, withdrawing at times, coming back in, really being unable to maintain strong influence. And, and if you look at the other side, the Iranians have. The Iranians have built strong networks of, of allies, armed groups across the region with a plan in sight, not a plan for just today and tomorrow, but a plan for you know decades in advance. And that's the strategic difference. The, the Biden administration right now, you know, before October 7th, was withdrawing from Iraq. There was the joint cooperation, the, you know, dialogue, security dialogue, in which the, the Biden administration was basically saying, we are withdrawing our, our troops and this is what we want. And, and, and the Iraqi government was, was on the same page. So there was a process, a roadmap. Now, of course, October 7th has had, you know, has complicated that because of Israel bombardment of, of Gaza and, and, and also attacks against, you know, against Americans in, in, in Iraq and Syria, as we've seen, including the deaths. It's hard for the Biden administration now to be seen as withdrawing, especially in light of what happened in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. The Biden administration doesn't want to leave looking like it's running away or that it looks, appears weak. So that's where we're stuck right now. It's very okay. clear that both 
Mexican Americans and the Iraqi government want a want a withdrawal, but how do you how you construct that theater is is, is the challenge. And, and Renard, as far as the strikes themselves are, are concerned, what are we to make of the, of the scale and scope of them? Were you surprised at, at how far they went, and and will they? Uh, as national security spokesman John Kirby uh, is hoping, uh, get the attacks against U.S. interests in the region to stop? Well, first of all, I mean, there have been attacks against Kitab Hezbollah and, and other of these armed groups, these Iran-allied groups in Iraq and Syria for many years. Um, you know, places like al Qaim, which was hit quite heavily, have has constantly been been hit over the years. So I wasn't surprised as such by, by, by these hits. You know, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, who was killed uh, alongside Qasem Soleimani by the Americans, you know, in January 2020, was the head of Kitab Hezbollah and, and many of these groups. I think what's become clear Clear is as a response, you could attack, you could kill their leaders, you could continue to, to attack their economic interests, you can sanction them, but this isn't working. These groups are surviving and, and, and they're more influential. So there's just a fundamental predicament that the Americans have, and that is that their policy tools, whether it's attacking, whether it's sanctioning, isn't working to advance American interests. Lawrence Corbett, to what extent did President Biden have to act and, and order these strikes. He, he was in a pretty impossible position, wasn't he, but needed to tread a fine line between deterrence, as, as the U.S. sees it, and escalation. Well, there's no doubt about it. He had to do something, both, I think, strategically and politically, because he's up for re-election and the Republicans have criticized him for just leaving our troops in there, in their view, defenseless. So I think his first response was very, very well planned. OK, unfortunately, some people were killed, about 37 in the two places, but they attacked the infrastructure of the forces there, about 85 of the targets so far. And this will make it more difficult for them to continue attacking the American uh, the American uh, uh, forces. So I think it's been measured. What I think was really significant is the fact that we use B-1 bombers that flew all the way from the United States because these are nuclear capable. Now, they weren't taking nuclear bombs, but they can really uh, unleash devastating consequences, much more than a, a fighter aircraft that you might have on an aircraft carrier. And the other thing is, I think we're basically working with the Iranians to ensure this doesn't get out of hand. Remember, we alerted the Iranians that ISIS were going to attack them about a month ago. We told them because that's why we're there. Remember, ISIS, the one who attacked us on 9-11. So we have been concerned about it. We okay. were not involved in this. No, 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 no. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I was, I was just uh, coming towards the end, end of your point here. But, but Mohammed Marandi is, uh, I could see him smiling and shaking his head here. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and he wants to, wants to get in. Go, go ahead, Mohammed. <laughs> yes, the Americans did not give any intelligence about the bomb attack. Uh, that is just a, a fable. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, the facts remain the facts. The United States occupation in Syria and Iraq are illegal. Contrary to what your good guest in London believes, the United States had, has no plans to leave Syria or Iraq. And the United States has been dragging its feet as much as possible, and it will do so unless forced to leave. But what the United States did last night is not going to change anything. They, most of the people that they killed were innocent people. They bombed a bakery. They bombed a gas, gas station. They bombed a recreational park. And they killed a few Syrians and a few Iraqis. They didn't touch Iranians. And they bombed the same place that they've been bombing for many years. They bombed, as your guests in London pointed out, they bombed these areas in the past. And it is interesting that as soon as the Americans carried out these airstrikes, ISIS attacked these bases in four different areas. Why is that the case? Because the United States has been working with the tribes that were with ISIS before. And Al-Tanf is a center for that. So ultimately, if the United okay. States wants to continue down this road, it can. Right. It can kill more people. It yep. can create more misery. But okay. this is going to get worse. And the United States ultimately, mm -hmm. just as it failed in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and Yemen and elsewhere, it's going to fail here as well. 
Okay, we're, we're, we're rapidly running out of time. Renata, I will come back to you. You can have the final word. But first, I've, I've, I've got to let, <laughs> let Lawrence respond to, to what he's just heard. Well, again, I think it's important to keep in mind, we wanted to get out of Iraq. It was a mistake for us to invade, and it cost us much more than we thought. We were asked to go back. I can't emphasize that too much because President Obama was trying to get out of uh, that, that area. He campaigned on it. We were asked to go back. That's why we went back. And we have back channel communications with Iran all of the time. And as I say, again, I have very good information that we warned Iran about the ISIS attack because that's who we're fighting. And previous to October 7th, all of these years since uh, 2014 to 10 years, our forces weren't attacked. It was only after October 7th that they were attacked, hoping that would get us to put pressure on uh, on Israel. And okay. by the way, we are putting pressure on Israel. OK. All right. Um, um, Renat, we're almost out of, out of time. Um, please briefly come in on, on what you've just heard. I wanted to ask you about, about what we're to make of U.S. policy in the region concerning these groups. Is there a coherent U.S. policy? I think one of the challenges for the, for the U.S. isn't incoherence in, 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 in the policy. It's a sort of one foot it, one foot out approach, um, which isn't working. As I say, the Americans have killed very senior armed leaders in, in Iraq, Syria over the years. They've sanctioned many of these groups. All the policy tools that the U.S. have to try and, uh, you know, fight, battle these groups or try and maintain their own influence aren't working. And that's why we're in the reality that we are today, which, which is an, an, an arena and a region where the Americans influence is, is, is waning. And, you know, 20 years, 21 years on since 2003, um, the U.S. Is, is, is losing its, it's increasingly losing its leverage. There, I'm afraid, gentlemen, we must leave it. Many thanks indeed to you all for being with us. Mohamed Morandi, uh, Renard Mansour and Lawrence Korb. And as always, thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again at any time by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us on our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, you can join the conversation on X. Our handle there at AJ Inside Story from me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha. We'll see you again. Bye for now. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.